Have you been injured in a motor vehicle accident? With over 40 years of experience in personal injury litigation, James Maliti and his team at Lawyers West LLP, well, they've seen it all. Check them out now at www.lawyerswest.ca to set up your free consultation. The Green Men are live here in Vancouver. Ashley Young delivers. Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of The Rise. My name is Ryan Sullivan. We welcome back, of course, the finest co-host on earth, Jay Demerit. Welcome, sir. Always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, we have new cue cards. That's an upgrade. We do, yeah. And there's a sticker on a poster board. That's pretty good. Yeah. We have a, we have a set now. Yeah. We also have Kai Kamara here. That's also a, we do. A right, pretty good Speaking addition. right in the middle of that set. As long as you guys don't have yellow cards or red cards, then we're good. <laughs> True. We're excited, man. True. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Whitecaps legend. No. No, not in that. Not, uh, yet. not in that echelon. Not yet. I don't know. It's a good term. I beg not to yet. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Give it yet. time. Give it time. Uh, the show, of course, uh, presented as always by our good friends over at Lawyers West, James Maliti. He's not a good man. He's a great man. And uh, if you have any law needs, by all means, Lawyers West, uh, they're the ones to do it. Google them up, and they are good people. Uh, so. The goal of this show, unlike the week ahead last year, the week ahead, it's, it was just sports news. And if you look at sports news now, a lot of it has kind of a negative connotation, a negative tone to it. Um, just like any other news, if you're looking around on CNN or something like that. So we wanted to go from a different angle. We want to talk about a show that's beneficial to the youngins out there, to the youth. Teach them a good lesson. Teach them how people rose, hence the rise. Um, from start to finish or from start yeah. to where they are now. <laughs> and uh, also this show is in support of the Rise and Shine Foundation, uh, a great cause that 100%. Mr. Jamerit puts on. And uh, you had a couple soccer camps over the summer up in Pemberton. I did. Things went well? I did, yeah. It's, uh, you know, again, it just furthers the whole idea of like part of the reason we came up with this, the, with the show for this season is about, uh, you know, I had another session of camps hanging out with, you know, 13, 18 year olds all summer and really just getting to know them more and understanding how important it is that we do things for them and create curriculums for them to learn and maybe in a different and more holistic way that's that's more relatable to them now. And that's what the Rise and Shine Foundation is. It's a youth program. You know, I do a soccer camp, but, you know, my wife does one thing. There's other curriculums there that come up, and uh, um, the, the plan is to create well-rounded kids, and that's uh, that's what we're doing. So, you know, everything, even from this show now, hopefully can start – we want to create those messages, and, and, and again, they're powerful messages, and they're, they come from a lot of different things, and uh, mentors are, tell stories, and that's what we want to do here. We want to tell really interesting and, and unique stories that have to do with uh, how we rise uh, as humans and, and, and create our own successes, and that's what we want to teach our kids, not necessarily how to kick a soccer ball. That's just a fun bonus. Yeah, and I mean, you've got a heck of a story to you. I mean, starting out, uh, you know, getting into university out in Chicago, and then you kind of worked your way up got on with Chicago Fire and decided, okay, you know what, I'm just going to drop everything. I'm going to give this my best shot. I'm going to go overseas and see what I can do. And, uh, and I'm going to segue that because uh, a, Kai, a, a similar story as well. Um, coming over from Sierra Leone and uh, to the States, and we're going to get into all that good stuff, uh, but I want to know about your rise to yes. the top. I've seen, I've seen Jay's. It cost me $8 on, That's on right. iTunes. Available now. <laughs> One of the only few that could do it. <laughs> pack up their bags and go overseas and stay overseas. Because yeah. a lot of guys pack their bags back up and come back. Oh, know? yeah. yeah. Uh, because it's not easy. It's really not easy to um, just move to a, another country and, uh, you know, like going to England or anywhere. You know, like soccer was just, you know, it's soccer in America. And then you go somewhere where it's football, where the leagues have grown for so many years and decades and, yeah. and all this. And then you jump in there, you know, trying to adapt, you know, with the culture and everything. And that's how it, you know, it is or was with me when I moved to the, to the U.S. at the age 16. It's right then as a teen and, go, you know, right. I got pushed into high school when my educational level wasn't really in the high school level. You know, I grew up in the Civil War country in Sierra Leone. I've lived there my whole life and moved over, my English was so, so, and the next minute, I'm in high school, I'm in actually my second year in high school, um, second semester of high school right away. It's like, how are you gonna, you know, <laughs> how are you gonna 
cope up to everything else that's going on. And uh, it was tough. So can you can you, can you explain more or less, like, what was the difference? So the, the day-to-day Kai Kamara goes to uh, East Side High yeah. uh, as a junior to, like, what was what was your life like in Sierra Leone before you came? So can you yeah. get, give, just give a quick comparison? Yeah. yeah. Uh, growing up in Sierra Leone, so I'm from a little town called Kenema, you know, and uh, that's in the east part of Sierra Leone. And uh, I had huge family, very, very big. And uh, so we all or in this one big compound house with three different buildings. So we all always stay together. Awesome. People get married, they get married into the house. You don't right. get married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Older brothers got married, their wives came into the yeah. house. So the family just kept growing, you know? And it's amazing. And uh, going to school, um, we, you know, we, I'm going to, going to primary school, secondary school. Um, it was great. You know, the Civil War broke out. So... School was stopped for a long time. We didn't go to school for a long time, but we got to play street soccer during that whole time. You know, being a kid, that's the only thing you focus on. You just want to play. Mm. You know, it's just like now when my daughter comes back from school every day, hey, what'd you do today? We played. Mm. She, you don't tell me anything else that they learned. <laughs> so doing all those things and, you know, being through that, the Civil War didn't really affect me as much or I didn't think about it until maybe I was about 13, 14. That's when I basically started thinking about it like, oh, crap. Like, this is really serious because then I started losing family members that I can keep those memories and saying, okay, that person is never coming back. And this is so-and-so just happened to that person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's incredible. I mean, can, can you kind of de- describe just, I mean, like, you know, you want to go out, you want to kick the ball around, but you have all of this going on around you weighing the pros and cons of going out and actually kicking the ball around because yeah. um, it's a pretty scary situation. Yeah, no, it is. It really is. And, uh, you know, um, <laughs> It's good to grow up in a family where everyone, you know, was very focused and very serious and look out for each other. You know, our older brothers or sisters, my aunties and all this, always want to, you know, have a, an arm's reach, you know, of you, where you are at. Um, we go outside to play, but no matter what happens, they're always coming outside and screaming your name and making sure that when they, you know, Kai and I can still hear them that I'm not too far away yeah. and all that. And my brothers, you know, most, most, most people in the town really, we're all connected somehow. So families know families. For sure. It happens yeah. when you come from a small town. Right. And so that helped out a lot. You know, it was good and bad because there came a point where <laughs> my family became the, the, the hunted family because we were the family that lived in the big compound. So everybody, you know, when the bad things happen, they're like, oh, yeah, let's go get them. They have everything, you mm-hmm. know, let's go reach out to that house. Let's go loot that house and this and that. So those things happen and it gets really scary. Yeah. And so from Kenema, then we moved into the capital city of Freetown and being in Freetown, obviously things went from calm to the worst like attack that could have ever happened in the country, you know, in January 6 in 99. And that was really bad. And from that, that's when we were able to move. Um, we moved to the Gambia. Uh, which is another small African Kakuda, ho- former home of Kakuda Mene. There you Mene. go. There oh, you go. Nice. Yeah. And, 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 and Pamaduka. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of history with the Gambia. Yeah, so I lived absolutely. in Gambia for two years um, and then finally moved to the U.S. as a refugee. So you've got all this stuff going on. Uh, you come over, and, and I should mention that uh, everything that I know about Kai Kamara is from Wikipedia. Um, and so, and I don't donate, so I don't know Thanks if it's to the correct. People at Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's correct information, but we'll find out. Um, so yeah, you, you come over as part of a, a refugee program, and, and you get dropped in Maryland from Sierra Leone. Uh, a pretty big transition, uh, change gears of lifestyle. Uh, but you know, what what happens from yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, it was cold. Yeah, it was yeah, <laughs> it was cold because it was in October and uh, um, dropped in Maryland. My uh, my mom's older brother lives in Maryland. So she felt like the best way uh, for me to focus and go to school was to be in Maryland, you know, be over there so I can have a, a father figure, you know, in the house, a man in the house that would tell me, you know, what to do and all this, and which was great. Uh, he's a doctor, and uh, it kind of didn't work out a little bit because I just wanted to play sports. Um, not necessarily when I moved to the U.S. saying I wanted to play soccer. It just, I just wanted to play sports. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I wanted to be outside all the time while he wanted – us in the house, you know. What other sports books. did you play? I was trying to play basketball, you know. I'm a really good volleyball player. Oh, so, nice, okay. Yeah, volleyball, I played volleyball in high school. Yeah. So basketball, I was trying to catch up, but d- during those times, because everyone, you know, all the black kids in the neighborhood played basketball, and okay. that's what everybody did. Nobody really played soccer. Yeah, and you so could then, jump. 
I jumped into it. Eh, I can do that, but I can't shoot. Right. <laughs> so I grabbed the rebound and I passed it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it didn't work out so well. So finally, I said uh, I'm moving to my mom, and I moved to California. Yeah. Um, just a few months later, moved to LA so I can be with my mom. She was very scared, you know, because here's a teenage boy coming over. She works a lot. She's never home, and you know, I have to be there with her. But um, that was the focus. That was the focus because when I moved. I just knew what I had to do because the whole time I've been in Sierra Leone in Africa and my mom had been in the U.S., she's done everything for us. You know, she sent, you know, anything that I need. You know, I was one of the first kids in the neighborhood with a BMX bike straight from America. So, like, nice little helmet, <laughs> gloves, and knee pads and all that. I was right around town and everybody knew, you know who I was. So, when I came over, I was one of the few teens that can really stay focused and just say, okay, she's done all this for me. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to focus and really go to school and stay out of trouble because in LA or the neighborhood that I was in Hawthorne um, was not the best. Sure. And so the best way for me to stay out of this trouble is when I was there, as she was at work, the first sports I actually played in school was volleyball. Mm -hmm. And then when volleyball was done, then I went to track team. I did cross country. Then I played soccer. So all the time I tried to stay in sports because after school I didn't want to come home. Because if I came home, then I'd be involved in other stuff. So I stayed in school. So I'm involved in all these sports. Okay. Now, now I, I'm always in, in in awe of these kind of stories and and uh, for lack of better words, like the independence um, that you had at such an early age. And and like you know, J Jay's can can relate. I mean, packed up, went overseas. Um, you know, there's that great unknown. And like for myself, like I grew up in North Vancouver, which is essentially like Amish country. Uh, you could <laughs> leave a million it's pretty, bucks. It's pretty nice over there, you know. Yeah, you could leave. Well, I, I don't. I never seen a million, but you could leave a hundred bucks in the street, and it'll be there the next day for you with a bow on it, probably. And like it's just like I I, I lived a, a very I think sheltered life growing up, and like you know you know this is going to be here the next day, you know what you're doing the next day, and it's just very uh, organized. Whereas yourself. Um, you came over at the age of 16 yes. um, to avoid a civil war going on. Um, and then you decide, okay, you know what? I'm going to try things on the other side of the country. I'm just going to pack up um, and I'm going to go over. Like, at what point in your life do you think that kind of independence kicked in? Because it's great because it, it can give you a push to the next level where you want to be at. So like, at, at what point in your life did you realize, okay, if I want to make it, if I want to make this happen, yeah. This is what I got to do. I think it's when I decided I was going to move to L.A. When I said I was going to move with my mom and I knew she lived by herself and uh, she worked. And I mean, everybody wants to live in L.A., but to me, it was different. You know, it wasn't just, OK, go live the L.A. lifestyle. It was just, OK, I don't want to be here because I really want to play sports. and I want to go live with my mom. But how am I going to do it? You know, so now I go where my mom is working from 5 to 2 a.m. So that's why I said, so right then and then when I started going, you know, I'm in school and then they said, okay, you want to play sports? This is what you have to do. You have to get this grade, you know, 2.5 and this to make sure that you can stay on the team. And so then all those responsibilities started coming in play to say, okay, I must do this if I want to continue to play on the volleyball team or if I want to run track. And then later on, I, you know, approached my mom again because she had never really came out to watch me play in high school. You know, I was doing all this, but uh, or even to go watch me play on the Hurricanes, you know, because she was so busy. But I never blamed her for any of that, because in my mind, I had made new family, you know, with these teams that I'm playing for. Mm -hmm. And then later, I was like, you know what? I want to go to college. So mm -hmm. I talked to her. I was like, Mom, I want to go to college. And she goes, well, I don't have money. So there is a college down the street that was El Camino University, the El, El Camino College, the the need, community college. I need to ask what the team name was at El Camino. Oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they should be called the Caminos. Guess. Yeah, the El Camino, El Camino. El Camino. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, and she said, you can go to El Camino College, you know? Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's just where everybody goes because it's a two-year school. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And so, again, through the coach of, you know, Bruce Myrie, and the, so he introduced me to Joe Flanagan at Dominguez Hills. Yeah. And then I saw at Dominguez Hills, they were building the Home Depot Center for the mm -hmm. first time, the Galaxy Stadium. And I say, I'm sold. Nice. I say, I'm going to go to this school, and I'm going to try to play on one of those teams. That's and, right. Uh, yeah. And it works. 
It works just I like play, I didn't play for Galaxy. <laughs> just, well, <laughs> yet, yet, no, keyword no. again, yet. No. Um, well, and one thing I want to talk about because I came through this way too. Let's talk about the PDL. This is the next step. Oh, so this yes. is just after college. This is the league. Um, you know, people in Vancouver recently have heard because the TSS. I'm yeah. actually sit on the their board. A local Vancouver team, PDL, uh, which is basically the Professional Development League. Yes. These are kids that are in college, uh, on the verge of graduating college, and trying to make it in the pros. Um, Let's talk about the PDL because yeah. for me, PDL was like one of the major um, it was stepping stones it to, was my, to my to my journey, wasn't it? And, and 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 it was so worth it because I, based on my story, I needed that extra step because yes. I didn't come through an academy program. I yeah. came in from the back door, much like yourself. You had yeah. to come in and earn your right, right? You didn't have it when you yeah. were twelve, yeah. And uh, and and in a way, that's what teaches the character we're trying to talk about. But I also think that. Um, we all need stepping stones along the way, wherever they may be. And and uh, talk to me about the PDL and 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 what what your experience was for that. Like, should I try to play pro or should I just you know go get a go get a real job? And that's such a real scenario for athletes in yeah. college, especially yeah. you know as as they start to exit or figure out what their exit plan to professionalism is. Like, how did you navigate that See, situation? I didn't, I didn't really like. I I liked the PDL. I didn't really understand what you know how strong. Um, the the profile of the of the PDL really was so I was playing PDL I was playing for the Orange County Blue Stars, mm -hmm. and uh, my team was stacked. You know, Jordan, you know Harvey played with me. Sasha Kleshin, like everybody played on the <laughs> team. Whatever yeah. I can name, you know, almost everybody. You know, me, Kalen Carr, and. All these guys, we all played on that same team together. That's, good. And That's a good unit. <laughs> <laughs> That's, not bad. That's a good Tell Saturday me. night as well. <laughs> what a team. What a team. And uh, well, every once in a while, too, Jurgen Klinsmann played with us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. so, all right. I, all so right. the days that they say, oh, you're playing with Jurgen uh, uh, up top. And I was like, wait. <laughs> Jurgen? Shows up in his short shorts. Oh, and his skin is copas. Uh, his, uh, I, his energy was just amazing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, just playing PDL, it was great because I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what it was that much, but until they told me that, you know, we get to play against, you know, the Chivas and the, the Galaxy, and when teams are in preseason, we get to play against them. So that was, you know, I was sold. Uh, but so, okay, so, so you go from PDL, uh, you make it, you, you move up to the MLS. Um, what was the move like across from, because we'll come back to MLS yeah. uh, just as you did, but uh, what was the move like going over, it was uh, – i to check my cue cards. Norwich City? Norwich City. Norwich City. There yeah. we go. The Canaries. The Canaries. The Canaries so baby. how does, uh, like, you know, how does that, how do you comprehend that? You're going overseas, uh, across the pond. Carroll Road. Yeah. Uh, Is that what it, right? That was the stadium? Watford? Car yeah. To play one of the highest Before, levels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. Before I actually went to Norwich. Yeah. And I think it's 2000 and I got drafted in 06. So... I'll check my work. Yes, so for those of you I that think. don't know, Norwich is a team in, in the UK <laughs> in England that usually usually flux, fluctuates between the first division and the they're, Premier they're League. Up and down. They're yeah, up they're kinda down. like a Watford. Like they so, got a really good fan base and Oh two thousand six and seven you was with Watford. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Do you guys no, I No, we didn't. But I was gonna say twenty thirteen no, is what Wikipedia into, I ran tells me. Into him okay, once. okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that, but I ran into him once. Oh wow, okay. Then you nice. know, Here we college. go. <laughs> oh, and he big time you. Being in college, oh, you know, watching. You know, why would you do that, Jeff? Like, hey, I don't, I'm looking forward to this story. Being in college and watching the Premier League. So yeah, you know, being in college watching the Premier League, and you know, knew yeah. he was the American guy playing over there, and you know, the name was there. And when I first got into the league, there was a Generation Adidas program. That's what the program yeah. I got into. And so we went to England after the first season to train and then visited different places. Were you with Siggy? I was with Siggy. Oh, so you remember that okay. group? I now, do yeah, remember so that we were group. There, and then he comes by. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were raining, at they came yeah. to our training ground. We did. It was <laughs> yeah. raining that yeah. day. And you guys saw, like, and he walked right past. So, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, nice. That. But. And obviously you remember. Yeah, yeah bro. Yeah. You, you remember every second of it. There. Oh, That's it's hard to forget. Really. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Yeah, it's hard but to forget. But that was great. It was great, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, that was the, you know, we went there. And, you know, those things started getting into your mind. Like, I didn't really still think I'm good enough to play in England. You know, and then, you know, I was having a really good time in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And when I was, uh, people, one or two people were started mentoring it. It was more when I was playing for my national team. Because in Sierra Leone, people don't get to see the MLS much. Mm-hmm. People started hearing more about the MLS when Beckham came to the MLS. For sure. Right. So after then, more people were talking about it. Oh, MLS. So people were like, you have to go play in England. You have to go play in England. I was like, it's not that easy to go play in England. Mm -hmm. I was like, but okay. So my focus then changed. Instead of just being a professional soccer player, it's like, how can I play in England? 
Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, I started talking to it about a few more people and they said, well, you just have to get a certain amount of games with your national team. And I was like, well, I'm a, na- I'm a regular player on my national team. And I was in preseason actually, seriously, when my phone rang and they said, uh, North City would love to take you on a loan. And I went straight to the coach's office and said, I have to go. Yeah. And I was actually injured. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a groin, like, <laughs> I had a hernia problem. I went to England and played 11 games and didn't say one word about my hernia and just played. <laughs> nice. And had a blast. I can tell them that. Yeah. All right. Now, you know what? That is actually a great reminder that uh, I need to pay the bills. I need to talk about a couple ads because our first one is a physio clinic. So We're at halftime. We're the at hernia halftime. injury. Yeah. And I like to call this the Berard block because we have three Berard sponsors this Ooh. year. Yes. First up. Our good friends at Berard Physiotherapy, manual therapy, IMS, laser exercise, prescription, you name it. If you have lower back pain, whether you've had it for 10 years or 10 minutes, they can get it done. Over 150 years combined experience. You know you're in the right hands with our good friends at Berard Physiotherapy. Coming back for season two. Can we call this, I guess this is season one of The Rise because we had a show on before. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but so far, so good. I'm liking, we're, we're doing some like good work. We're I'm, doing pat, here. I'm patting us on yeah, the Yeah, I think it's we're flying. Right. Would you I believe just, this is I our... I just like the way he put that in there. <laughs> the hernia to that. I had to segue. That's, just, that's perfect. I had to segue, yeah, that's you know. perfect. <laughs> to segue right. school. And uh, our good friends at Barad Roofing returning as well. And now this. Drip, drip, drip. Ladies, you don't have to sleep with that drip tonight. You know, that annoying drip in your home you just haven't gotten around to getting rid of? Berard Roofing and Drainage can fix that annoying drip. For 40 years, Berard Roofing and Drainage has been fixing roof leaks right down to the cause, guaranteed. Call Berard Roofing and Drainage. Call 604-986-1812. Berard Roofing and Drainage. We've got you covered. All right, and now one that you may not know of just yet. We talked about it a little bit beforehand, but uh, they uh, brought the green men back. The green men donned the spandex. We did it for a little uh, shoot and a stay at the Burrard Hotel. Fine folks, still to be oh, working oh. with them. Check it out. You just might find a green man in your bed. If you're lucky. Even two guys in green spandex sometimes need to break away from regular life. And the Burrard has everything we need. Space for hanging out. Bikes for exploring. Sweet rooms for getting ready for the game. And an amazing downtown location. So So book book your Berard Berard breakaway now now and we'll see you at the game. Your staycation destination deep in the heart of downtown Vancouver, the fine folks at the Berard Hotel. And uh, enter this promo code, you can see it at the bottom of the screen now. Uh, you'll get yourself a nice discount and uh, a great welcoming package too. You go there, they got red truck beers, and of course we can talk about red truck all, well, in this camera, in your camera, they're getting uh, some great promo going on. If only but, they had uh, beer in those boxes. Yeah, tons of red <laughs> truck, you got you got tons of chips, tons of snacks yeah. waiting for you, you got ping pong tables, you got a fire pit, everything going on at the Bright Hotel. So if you want to come into the city, you want to go to a game, you want to see Kai in action, and you want to have a few bevies while you're at it, you should probably stay at the Burrard. You know, you shouldn't be, don't be driving back home. Check out the folks at Burrard Hotel. Yeah. That's what the promo code's all about. We're helping out. I love it. It's people helping people. That's what we do here at The Rise. People. Um, there we go. So, okay. Let's get right back to it. Back to the cue cards. Uh, we're at Norwich. Mm-hmm. And then we move over to Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough? Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough. Yeah. Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough. It's a bro. Okay. Yeah, right. middles, middles, bro. Middles, bro. Middles, bro. Middles, bro. Middles, bro. I like that. Okay, yeah. so we're, we're going with that. So uh, oh. the uh, the switch, uh-huh. I- explain kind of, um, I mean, you go to Norwich. I mean, that obviously um, is a, leaves a, a great taste in your mouth. Your first time over playing in England, it's incredible. Um, and then you make the switch. Yeah. No, I just, just like you said, perfect there. I left a really good taste in my mouth playing at Norwich, playing the Premier League and all these teams I used to wake up on Saturday to watch, you know, Premier League games. And finally, you're in England playing. And uh, my loan finished in Norwich, and I came back to Kansas City. And all I just wanted to do was just go back out. I said, I need to go back out to England, and I want to play. And so when the windows were open again, a few teams were calling, and I just wanted to hop back out there. But this time, it was in the championship, and it was – Middlesbrough, and I said, yes, I'm up. I'm up for it. I got on the plane. I was Actually, it was on my birthday, my 29th birthday. 
September 1st, last day of the move. I was like, there you go. And I went there. And uh, it didn't go so well. You know, sometimes things don't go well. And that's what happened. I got there, I don't remember, five or seven games later, the manager got fired. Mm -hmm. So obviously it becomes difficult. You know, you go in mm -hmm. and somebody gets let go that brought you in. And uh, things, you know, change. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the golden goal. Let's talk about your successes now in the MLS. Um, when you... When you when you're like in the talk of an MLS All Star, when you're when you're winning um, when you're winning trophies, when you're when when you know again, let's talk about their highest successes. Yeah. You know, like to lead the league in scoring, MLS All Stars. Like, what does that stuff mean to you? Was that something that was just part of the bonus package, or was that always something you thought you could get to? Um, and what's it like to uh, you know um, tie for the win of the Golden Boot and <laughs> not get the title? <laughs> That whole question was just a wind up. Right yeah, there. it was. It was. Right it wasn't one. just a wind up, though. But <laughs> like, just build you know, it up. It's just <laughs> <laughs> one of ten to ever score hundred goals right. in the MLS. No, no, honestly, though, these are these are major successes. So, <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, like, you know, talk about the process of, of achieving those things. And again, now we talk about leadership, but now let's talk about mindset. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things. Again, we always try to talk about when people like rise to the to their successes is what is what's their mindset. Now you're a leader. Yeah. And now you have to now you have a mindset that's created that cre that breeds the best, right? And, and and you to be the best. So like, what does that look like? Yeah, no, it just one you know what you know is you know do your job. When you're doing your job and doing your job right, it makes everybody else's job easy. You know, people say that a lot, but it's true because if I'm doing my job as a goal scorer, I'm scoring my goals. It makes it makes it look very easy how the the system and the style that that team was playing. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, Kai's scoring a lot of goals. No, that's because everybody else was making it easy. Everybody else did their job right, and they put the ball to the right place, and then I had to do my job to finish it. And, yes, going back to, you know, time for, you know, the league leading goal. But to me, when I see all that, you know, it's like me going back and saying, you know, I saw you, you know, in England. When I was there, I was like, wow, you know, that's Jay. It's the same thing when I'm in that position, and I'm in the position with, you know, somebody as uh, Shabasha Javinko. I'm like, Wow, like mm -hmm. this is you know Javinko. Yeah, like, it's me. <laughs> yeah. no, I hear you. Are you, are you yeah, me? you know. So I'm like, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, and it just keeps you know, it pushes me every day, every game I'm playing because I want to know how much more I can get from that. But this thing that's pushing me is making you know the team better and people that's around me better. You know, because you having just this little drive that once you know you want more, and wanting more is helping. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, I love that and I enjoy that. And, you know, demanding from my teammates, you know, to get me the ball in the box and make sure I'm doing this, it's good. Not only that, yes, I'm, you know, I'm also trying to be a leader when we're in the locker room and doing all this. So it's not just about scoring all these goals, but where's the goals going to lead us? Mm -hmm. a, a major pitfall that a lot of uh, younger guys that are, you know, coming up, new in the league, a uh, major pitfall that they fall into is they score a few goals and it goes right to their head. Uh, we've had a few guys, uh, you know, that have come through the white caps through the years um, that you could kind of like tell have, have you know, kind of gone down that road. But then there's other guys as well that just have like, you know, they're, they're humble, you know, they, they score some goals li like yourself. And you say, you know, it's not me, it's, it's everybody else putting the ball in the right spot. And then I just, you know, tap in. I just capitalized. Yeah. And I just completely like, belittled all your – they're just tap-ins. No, they're but, all just, it's, but, no, but, but you know it's what true. I mean. It's, uh, I mean, look at the goal I scored this last weekend. I, I just have to be in the box to do my job, which is put the ball in the net. goals. It's – Do it 100%. Did what he had to do. Yeah. It, everything put the ball in the box. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's like a whole team effort to, to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And – what do you say to these guys? I mean, whether you've played on their team or not, or, or maybe what, you know, in your mind, would you say to them if they're on the opposing team or something, if they get to this point where they're like, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm the hottest stuff in town now, had a hat trick last game or whatever, and, uh, and you know, you know it's going to end up hurting their career yeah. because it's going to hurt them throughout the league and inner circles. Yeah. Uh, but you yourself, I mean, I feel like you've had the career that you had uh, because, you know, you've kept that personality and then that humility. To me, uh, being a professional, one thing I say, you know, to most of the young guys is consistency. You know, if you want to score goals and you think, you know, I've scored two goals or three goals and, you know, I'm on top of the world, fine, keep that. But can you be consistent doing that? You know, I say consistency is 
how many games can you go you know in a row continue to start and when you start what you're going to do your job to stay in there you mm-hmm. know so that's why i try to preach to a lot of the guys it's yeah i have to score goals and i want to score goals because that's my job but there's the other things that i do defensively come back for corner kicks and make sure that i'm dangerous mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. holding the ball up and making sure you know i'm killing time for my team consistently if i'm doing those things maybe i'm not even scoring the goals but I'm doing the stuff right and people around me are getting, you know, success from it. My coach sees that and knows that I'm consistent. I'm doing the same thing over and over. So if you're going to score, you know, three, four, how many goals you're going to score and, you know, you keep doing that and it's, you know, your head's up there and you're enjoying it, fine. But just make sure you're also playing, you know, at the same rate that you're playing. Don't stop playing because of I just scored three goals. You know, don't stop defending. Yeah. You know, you just shut me down, and the next minute now you want to get the ball and fake me and dribble, and then I yeah. stole it from you, and that's it. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. done, you know? 80, 80 Boothroyd used to do, like, once stats became more of a – so we were, like, you know, once we finally had budgets in our at our Watford days to afford, like, statisticians and things like that, we used to do a lot of things of the accountability scale based on, like – if you score three goals in four games, yes, you're on a high, but you, you, then all of a sudden you're compared to the guy like an Aaron Robin who's doing 15 goals, 14 assists over five years. Yeah. Every year. Yeah. That's professionalism. Yes. That's consistency. Not three games in a row. And that's always like a good lesson where you actually see that number and you're like, whoa, <laughs> okay. <laughs> back to the humble pie for a bit but <laughs> if you keep that up now you're going but again that creates that mindset so it's not it's not like look so far down you know it's, it becomes like a, okay yeah you did three games now do three more and then you'll see what 10 in a row is and you'll you'll understand the work required to do that very true very and, true. and and I, I feel like that's the best in, that i have seen it was when he started to really break it down be like okay you want to be the best winger look at the best ringers in the world what are they producing how many games are they playing? How many minutes are they playing? How many miles are they running? And then are you doing anywhere near that? Nine times out of ten, they're go. not even close. And then you're like, oh, uh, okay, I got to get back to work. Year after year. And that's what I said. You know, like I said, most of the younger guys here in Vancouver with the Whitecaps in the locker room, when I'm talking you know, to Jake Nowinski or I'm talking to Alfonso Davis and most of these guys, I said, that's fine. This game is this game. But, you know, before when the season started, actually one of the advice I gave Alfonso was, I was like, how many games did you play last year? How many games did you start? I was like, can you go five to eight games starting mm-hmm. and doing the same things you're doing every day? Producing, If yeah. you can do that, then yeah. you're ready to become a real professional. Yeah. You know, and I think he's ready. Yeah. Do you think he's ready? <laughs> do you think he's ready? I think buying things is ready. Did you? <laughs> he's ready to get you that new Versace jacket, dude. <laughs> It, does, it, it is impressive, man. The, the run that he's had. Um, and was it 16, 17, 18 years old now? Or? He's 17, right? 17, 18 yeah. in November. That's, he's that's my a, son. I know all that. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, he could be. It's yeah. incredible. I mean, but like to, to kind of, um, I mean, similar to, to what you guys were saying, um, you know, you're, you're at the, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say early 30s. I'm not going to call you mid 30s. I'm 34. Exactly. Yeah, right. well, he's getting, old, well, I'm the oldest close guy in the early, white cap locker room. Are you? 34 is the oldest? I'm, always, I'm also the youngest one. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, but like, what's, what's that transition like going from like the young guy that just wants to play, um, you know, breaks into the league, goes overseas, now comes back. Now you're like the, you're the veteran that everyone looks up to for advice and, and how to extend their career and how to go overseas themselves. What's that like, that transition from just young gun to, oh, crap, now I'm the guy that has to give all the life lessons here. Yeah. Uh, how does that work for you? It goes by that quick. Like basically it does. Like drinking, <laughs> drinking that water. And that was just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like saying, you know, I just said my first year in the league, you know, I was in England and, you know, seeing this guy at training and then next minute, yeah, I'm 34, 13 seasons in. Playing early thirties, early thirties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, early thirties. Right. Thirty-two. So I'm gonna ride number, these early thirties. That's 30s. a number. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'm seeing that, and I'm like, wow. But I love it. I seriously, I've cherished, I've enjoyed every minute of it. You know, when I was stay in, as long as you can. When, when I was in England, <laughs> in the in in the in the dressing rooms, they call it there, not locker rooms, right? That's right. Yeah, I say locker room all the dressing time. Dressing room. And they, gotcha. They gave me a stick <laughs> for that. Um, in the dressing rooms, and they were just like, "Why are you so happy?" I'm like. <laughs> I'm hanging out in the locker room, in the dressing rooms yeah. with you guys. Because I'm not supposed to be here, yeah, and I have exactly. no idea how I got in here. But exactly. either way, I'm going to make the oh, most I'll of it. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, like, why, what am I doing here? And that's why I'm at And then I'm going on the field, and I'm just doing it because I'm enjoying it. And that's what I tell them. 
It's enjoy it every day. But you know, even our co-chair uh, Robo tells us that every day to everyone, like enjoy this, enjoy this every day. You know, you never know how long it's gonna last. And you know, you can take soccer so serious, but you can't take the fun out of it. You know, you got to make sure you're having fun because if you're not doing that and you just take it too serious, then it becomes just a job. Then it's like, why are you doing it? You know, so to me and to the young boys and everybody around, that's what I said. Like I said, I'm 34, but I'm in the locker room. Seriously, I'm younger than Alfonso Davies because I am dancing. <laughs> dance offs. I'm, do I'm doing all dance these off. things. Who wins <laughs> in the dance off between you two? I let him win. You let him win? Yeah. Okay. But I, at nightclub, though, nightclub, though, locker room, locker room, locker room, yeah. <laughs> locker room you're letting, yeah. you let it slide, but at night, nightclub, you, no, you're on. You can't get in. You can't get in. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get in. All right. I just made up this segment. Uh, we're going to call this the uh, keep on trucking question brought to you by the good folks at Red Truck. Keep on um, trucking. There you go. So, I mean, for, for those out there that are – trying to break through, trying to rise up. Uh, they're hitting obstacles. They're hitting barriers. They're doubting themselves. What's the keep on trucking advice? Keep on trucking. <laughs> <laughs> right, we need to rename the segment. We need to rename it. <laughs> no, uh, they're just speed bumps. You know, they're just speed bumps. They're not going to stop your car. You know, you just have to keep going because those are going to be the ways you're able to to tell those stories, to tell, you know, the stories from the one speed bump to the next one to the next one. I wouldn't have been here today with you guys if I didn't, you know, come from Civil War and moving to, you know, Maryland, to California, to going to all these colleges and then being here in Bank, all these teams and being here because those were, you know, my little speed bumps that I hit everywhere. You know, some of them were bad, some of them weren't bad. But I'm here and saying it's never, you know, it's never bad. They're all life lessons for you to take something from it. Take something from England, mm -hmm. take something from Columbus, and take something from New England. And then I'm bringing all that, bundling it together to be here in Vancouver. And hopefully, yeah, this will be the stop. Mm -hmm. I love it, man. Well, my, my last question, and that's a good sum up, because, again, this is the rise. Uh, um, we don't want to talk about being the humanitarian of the year. Uh, I, and, and again, this is sums it all up. You know, like sometimes you're a player, sometimes you're a fan, sometimes you're uh, uh, a youngster, and sometimes you're the old head. But in the end, being a humanitarian is is all of that, right? So, what is your uh, uh, what's your key? To, you know, and again, for, again, I'm, I'm just touching on the fact that he won the the humanitarian of the year for the league uh, here in the MLS. So, you know, again, that's a that's a big that's a big honor, and that kind of sums up the whole idea. So, what is being a humanitarian? like to you and why do you why do you love that role and why are you so good at it and why and what are tricks that other people can learn from you tricks there's no tricks of being <laughs> that's true you have it in you or you don't have it in you. <laughs> you know if you're gonna play the role then you know it can be a humanitarian but to me it's my story my story of you know getting here today or the little laugh we just had about being in the locker room in England and like what am I doing <laughs> yeah. you know so that what am I doing here is what I'm you know trying to pass back on to all the charities that I'm involved in, you know, I have my own hardship hand foundation charity or going back to Sierra Leone and putting smile on these kids faces. We built a school, me and Michael LaHood who plays, you know, out in Cincinnati at the moment, we built a school in Sierra Leone. And I said, if even I don't win a championship ever, that is the biggest championship I'll ever win in my life. Cause mm -hmm. a school that will always be there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it's part of me. It's part of me. It's part of my story. I wish I would interact with professional athletes um, around the world when I was that young, but I wasn't able to. But the fact that now I'm a professional athlete and I'm just a dude, mm -hmm. and if I can come around and just hang out with anyone and make their day, then, you know, I just do it. And then at the end of the day, they call you humanitarian of the year. Sure. <laughs> Great. That's a nice trophy to have on the shelf. That's not bad at all. And, and right. speaking of uh, leaving a legacy, hang out for five seconds, and we're going to show you what the Rise and Shine Foundation is all about through Mr. Jay Demerit. But uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ryan. He's Jay. Kai Kamara, man. Thank you so much for coming by. Really do appreciate it. See? The good inaugural guest. Really, really got us going over the bank. <laughs> Thanks, Kai. Yeah, appreciate one, it. One thank episode in the book. Thank you so much, and we will see you in one week's time.
So we are sitting here at the future site of a really glamorous high-end facility called the Rise and Shine Retreat. Currently we are kind of bootstrapping it with some tents that we've set up to be glamorous campsites, aka glamping. They make perfect accommodation for kids who are joining us for Jay's captain's camps. Well, I think for us, you know, half of this is about the mentorship program. It's not actually about soccer. The sport is, is, is why we're out here. But the mentorship is, is truly about what skills can we present to these kids and really start to give them an idea of what other successful people are doing in this world. And we have fun little competitions, but we always try to walk them out in the, in the mentor's shoes because that's truly how these kids can learn. So we feel it's really important to make sure that they are able to identify their other skills and strengths and particularly passions. It's not just kids coming up and being coached by somebody in their particular sport. It's kids' eyes being open to the multitude of possibilities and potential for success beyond the field. The idea is to create well-rounded individuals through this program. And then the other side of it is, you know, we have all of these athletes who have transitioned out of sport or um, entrepreneurs who have moved on or changed their focus and transitioned out of whatever their career path had been. And it's cool to provide an opportunity for them to be part of it. To see kids grow and to see kids actually participate in these kind of activities is truly for me that the biggest benefit I get out of it all because I could see them physically developing right in front of our eyes. You know, we've been at, at the highest echelons of, of high performance, but we've also, you know, we're normal people, we're relatable people, just like everybody else. And we have this rare ability to, to now create the platform to, to understand what that means, to support each other, to bring back community, and in, in, in not only in our kids, but as adults and help each other. I think that, you know, when you achieve success as an athlete and you are so appreciative of all the people who put so much into it, it's only natural that you'd want to sort of turn around and share what you've learned and your experiences with the next generation. We call it the Rise and Shine Retreat. That's what we're trying to create. We want people to come here in the health and wellness space and say, when I leave here, I'm going to be shining brighter. I'm going to understand what Rise and Shine means and the mentality behind it. We want to create a multifaceted facility. We want to be able to host weddings. We want to be able to host kids camps. We want to do fundraisers. We want to host community nights where people come and play sand soccer. You know, we have the license and the, uh, the space to, to really create our, our, our own lifestyle and bring people along with that it, it, in all of this health and wellness sphere that you know we feel so strongly about and, and have a great crew that can help in those environments and create those atmospheres. And that's the kind of thing that, that we want to do here. We, we want to be unique. We want to set a new standard in how we should live and, and, and ultimately create a community that really cares for each other.